hello friends so today i'll be talking on this uh, very briefly on randomization types and uh, bias so this was covered during one of the session that we did for trainees uh, where we gave the critical appraisal of a, an article and generally you would know that in ifccm exams or in dnb exams or even in some of the western exams the like question exam we do give a journal article and ask our trainees to critically appraise so it is expected that trainees know certain nuances of uh, certain statistical tools or methodologies that are adopted uh, so recently we did discuss about hall tight trial uh, where we had a very brief uh, discussion on the types of randomization so it's just a 3 to 4 minutes video we will i'll take you on the types of randomization that a trainee is expected to know because in the hall tight trial uh, which came in lancet they used block randomization so the obvious question we would ask the trainees is what are the types of randomization so there are around uh, four to five types of randomizations uh, the the first simple randomization that one would expect to know about is simple randomization so as the name sounds it's a simple randomization where there is a sort of a single sequence of random assignment that is given in a group of population or patients that are identified but this simple randomization may not be ideal uh, for small sample size because in small sample size what happens when they are when a simple randomization is sort of allocated so there could be a group where uh, there could be certain uh, section of uh, population or patients uh, which may not be uniformly distributed and this can be a problematic especially if the sample size is small so so this is uh, so that's a problem is simple but it may be good for a very large sample size because then the population may sort of uh, be evenly distributed or it may be a good representation uh, in the randomized groups so this may not be the ideal one for a small sample size so block randomization as the name suggests so the whole population or the group of patients is divided into two sort of a, a groups uh, and we call it as a blocks it may be a two blocks or maybe a four blocks it will be a even number so as you see here this group of patients is divided into two blocks one into treatment room one into the control arm so this is called block randomization and each block will be of the same sample size in block randomization and the key strength of block randomization is it ensures a bit of a balance in terms of characteristics of the population or the patients that are randomized between two groups and in the hall tight trial that we discussed uh, recently to the trainee pool the block randomization was used so that there is uh, some sort of a balance with regards to characteristics of the patients that were being randomized and this can be useful in small studies so although this hall tight trial that we discussed the study sample size was close close to around 12000 so there they had used this block randomization uh, but the, the characteristic of this is it may be useful for small studies because the distribution could be possibly uh, more equal or more homogeneous in that pattern and uh, as you see here this is a two block randomization uh, the example of which is being depicted so that's about the block randomization so then this block randomization can further be refined into stratified block randomization as the name sounds uh, here a group of population or the patients is divided into two sort of a blocks you can call but in stratified randomization these blocks are called stratum uh, so this stratum is further divided based on certain characteristics into further subgroups and uh, this we call it as stratified block randomization so for all the listeners we need to remember the the whole group is divided into stratum with certain unique characteristics and then they are further divided into based on certain specific characteristics and uh, here the reason this is done is to control and balance influence of covariates which means to remove the influence of maybe the age maybe the comorbidities maybe the severity of illness you divide this uh, stratum into based on any of these characteristics it could be age it could be the comorbidities or it could be the severity of illness and so on and so forth uh, so so as i said so you would pick up one covariate and try to divide the population based on this so that you wouldn't want to have say for example influence of certain comorbidities on the findings that's why you subdivide into these categories 
and that's what we, we call it as stratified. So you wouldn't want uh, confounders to be present, like effect of maybe certain comorbidities on certain interventions that one needs to be. So this is stratified block randomization. So for a trainee, you can just Bear in mind, this is done to remove the influence of certain covariates on the study population. And this covariates can be anything. It could be uh, any of the physiological characteristics of a patient. So this is an interesting uh, randomization, which was used possibly in the COVID times or for any of the drug interventions. So this is called adaptive randomization. So this is shown pictorially, as you see, uh, in adaptive randomization, basically there is an adoption uh, of certain intervention based on the patient characteristics. Uh, so that this typically is done in certain drug studies, especially it can be vaccine studies or drug which is determined by the weight of the patient. So as you see, drug is provided in one dose and it is provided to the clinical trial side. But here the investigator de uh, decides as to what dose needs to be given to each patient. And that can be based on the age or that can be based on patient characteristics. So he is adopting. So the drug is the same, but he's adopting the usage of the drug based on the weight into certain characteristics uh, that needs to be applied to certain patients. So this is called adoptive randomization and typically used in maybe the drug studies or maybe in the vaccine studies also where certain doses of vaccines are to be used in certain groups of patients, so, so on and so forth. So that is in general about the adaptive randomization. So then the question that we would obviously ask is, what do we understand by inappropriate randomization? When do we say that randomization has not been proper? So simple randomization, block randomization, stratified block randomization, and adaptive randomization is what you can all remember, which are used in clinical studies. Inappropriate randomization, so I'm just putting pictorially. So one would think this is a proper randomization. So picking up the patients alternately. But uh, this is uh, considered as inappropriate because this can uh, this can sort of skew the sort of a representation of the population, or uh, picking up the population as first half and second half. So that also is inappropriate. So the simple way that I could apply to intensive care is saying that first 15 patients who come to ICU in sepsis, I will randomize into one group, and the and the second. 15 patients who come to ICU, I will randomize to other group. That would not be an appropriate randomization because then you would infuse a lot of bias into the whole study methodology. So any picking up one half of the population and saying that it is randomization also is inappropriate randomization. Or the randomization, randomizing the patient based on patient characteristics like date of birth, saying that someone born on the even date, we would put him in one group and someone born in the odd date, we would put them. So that also is not the ideal randomization. Or saying that patients who get admitted on Monday, Wednesday, Friday would be in one group, or Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday into one group. So those are all inappropriate ways of randomization. So based on patient characteristics, like date of birth, date of admission, date of discharge, or day of a week, all these constitute inappropriate randomization. So we'll talk about bias because why is randomization important? Because these types of randomizations, uh, what we sort of deliberated or what, uh, and how we customize to a study is basically to remove the biases into the study. So then the question that we would obviously ask then is what are the types of biases? So what is bias? Bias is uh, any sort of a factors that are influencing the result of the finding is defined as bias. Okay, so that is the definition. So there are different biases. There is something called selection bias, which is the most common bias. Then there's something called performance bias. Then there's detection bias, laboratory bias. Then there is sample size bias. And there are other biases also in addition to this, like publication bias, uh, so on and so forth. But these are the commoner ones which possibly trainee can recall and uh, remember, uh, which are possibly applicable to clinical studies. So, so what is selection bias? So I've just put everything pictorially so that you can remember. So see, this is the whole population. But here you have taken this sample with certain specific colors, which means this, this sample is not representative of all the population that is here, which means there has been some bias in trying to identify certain section of the population. Uh, so this is the entire population, but you are using one section, uh, the data. So this, this is called selection bias. Um, so then there is something called performance bias. So performance bias is where you have randomized into two groups, control group and treatment group. So somewhere the control group is aware that they are in the placebo group 
and the behavioral pattern of that the subjects are little different or exhibited differently because especially if it is a questionnaire based study then the this can, the type of response you get from the placebo group if they are aware would be uh, would be altering the findings of the study so it's a change of behavior and response of patients or or vice versa someone who is in the treatment group uh, may behave in a different way with regards to responses Uh, so on and so forth. This is called performance bias, and this is specifically seen in uh, placebo-controlled sort of a trial where there is an intervention drugs and there is a placebo. So, and this can possibly arise even in the vaccine studies where someone has received a vaccine, someone has received a placebo, and they are aware of that, so they are exhibiting differently or uh, uh, showing behavioral pattern which is in a different way. All this can lead to performance bias. then there's something called detection bias detection bias is where randomization has not been uh, proper as, or has not been completely blinded so here the personnel or the investigator is aware that uh, the group which is acting upon whether it is a placebo group or whether it is a control group or whether it's a treatment group uh, so which means the blinding has not been ineffective and they are aware of the groups and that also can infuse in the type of uh, results that can be generated from the study and this is called as detection bias then there is something called laboratory bias so laboratory bias is especially it this can happen even in maybe i would say uh, performing certain tests in maybe a pandemic like covid where if you are doing a study and the test is performed in a inappropriate way to determine the nature of the results so where the laboratory personnel or the personnel who is conducting a test uh is influencing the result of certain tests that are being conducted uh, uh, to alter the findings and this can possibly typically happen in a situation like pandemic where uh, maybe you are running this as a rt pcr test and you would want to detect the sensitivity of this test or the effectiveness of this test and the laboratory personnel may have a, have an influence on trying to determine the fallout of this test so this is called where biases in the way test is run interpreted or retested so this we call as uh, laboratory bias and then there is this uh, sample size bias where when there is a too much of heterogeneity in the population see you see this is a homogeneous population this may be good but if you have a too much of heterogeneous population like this like every patient is different this can influence uh, findings of the study and this can typically happen when the sample size is not very large insufficiently large sample size which can lead to imprecise estimates so this is about sample size bias there are other biases even publication bias is another one where you do a good study but we see this very often in uh, our clinical practice that there are certain publications which are biased towards certain uh, regions or certain sections of uh, society uh so and we see this globally also this is a problem so the, so these are some of the uh, commoner biases that we see in our clinical practice so very brief video for just for the trainees about randomizations types of randomizations and the type of biases they are expected to know because when we discussed halt icu trial there was a, a selection bias in this particular uh, study which we had we were discussing so i thought it was prudent that we discuss about the types of biases um so 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 that's the whole purpose of this so you can visit my website www.drpradeepranapa.com to rehear to this so i will try to do few more uh, basics of uh, statistical nuances a train is expected to know for icu exams uh, so this is the first of its uh, kind so we will possibly next time i may do confidence interval or maybe relative risk or ratio and so on and so forth uh because when we read an article and try to critically appraise we are expected to know these biases and the types of randomizations uh, one would use so thank you one and all